So, um, as many of you know, um, American college campuses in recent years have seen really a very troubling rise in anti-Semitism. Um, so I really want to start with, um, with that. Um, as an academic, I feel like that's the place I want to start first. Um, there's a new study that was just released by AMCHA. Uh, some of you may know, may have seen it, or may know of this organization, uh, which helps educate about, thank you, about rising anti-Semitism on America's college campuses. And they have this new study which shows an alarming spike in what we're seeing today um, in anti-Semitic hate speech and hate crimes as well directed against Jews. It's worth reading the whole report or the executive summary. Uh, both of them are online. And one of the key findings of this report is that hate speech directed against Jews, Jewish staff, Jewish faculty, Jewish students, that hate speech tends to be strongly correlated with anti-Semitic hate crime. So anti-Semitic incidents, right, hate crimes, are twice as likely to occur on campuses where there, there, where there are active BDS campaigns. They're eight times more likely to be on campuses where we have one anti-Zionist student group. They're six times more likely on campuses with one or more faculty member that's actively sponsoring boycotts and divestment. So I'm saddened to find my own campus uh, on this list, what I call a list of shame. Um, there are other campuses listed as well. Uh, Cornell's not on the list this year. It's something to be happy about. Um, but the bottom line here, okay, is to address this rise in anti-Jewish bigotry, we have to know what it is, right, uh, as this quote suggests. We have to have a proper definition of anti-Semitism, and then we have to educate our campus community. So I want to start with that question, okay, what is the new anti-Semitism, and when does criticism of Israel cross the line? So, um, What's important to really emphasize, I think, at the start of that, of that kind of conversation um, is that for the vast majority of Jews today on the planet, Zionism is a central component of Jewish identity. So to be anti-Zionist then, to be virulently anti-Zionist, is an inherently hostile stance from the perspective of most Jews. Some people call anti-Zionism uh, an assault on Jewish identity. Okay. So it's, it's necessary to interrogate what it means. What, what, does, what does this assault entail? And what we find it entailing today um, is calling for a demise of Israel, a demise of the one and only Jewish state that exists on the planet, challenging the right of Israel to exist, seeking to deny the Jewish people the right to self-determination. And it's an attempt to roll back this internationally recognized right. So anti-Zionists then are engaged in a type of racist endeavor. Okay, but they're also running roughshod over 100 years of international law. And it's really important to mention that as well. Okay, so you have someone like um, Jonathan uh, Sachs, who is uh, the late chief rabbi uh, in Great Britain, talking about defining anti-Semitism as this racist endeavor, but we can also think about it in terms of, of a rollback of international uh, legal rights. Okay, so last Sunday, if I gave this talk last Sunday, I <coughs> said today, uh, it was July 24th, uh, was the anniversary of the League of Nations adoption of the British Mandate for Palestine. This was the first step to the eventual founding of the state. The mandate was a legal binding document. It, uh, it conferred uh, onto the Jewish people the right to settle in Palestine, even explicitly encouraged them to settle there, to reconstitute a national home. Okay, but what happens last week is we have President Mahmoud Abbas, right, the president of the Palestinian Authority, announcing plans to sue Britain over the Balfour Declaration, which set the stage for the mandate. 
Okay, so how can something like that be viewed as anything other than an affront, than an effort to deny the long Jewish history and presence and bond with the Holy Land? And a lot of people saw it as a joke. There were these kinds of um, images tweeted and shared on Facebook and social media. Um, but it's not really a joke, and the Israeli Foreign Ministry didn't treat it as a joke either. Because what it really is, is an attempt to deprive fundamental rights to only the Jewish people, and that is the very essence of discrimination. And what Mahmoud Abbas is trying to do is really what BDS, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, is also trying to do. It's an effort to re retroactively to roll back retroactively and revoke the Jewish people's right, established by international law, their right to statehood. There's simply no conceivable sense in which attempts to retroactively strip the Jewish people and only the Jewish people of fundamental rights can be anything other than anti-Semitic. So we have BDS leaders like Omar Barghouti who have long argued that justice for Palestinians can only come at the expense of justice for Jews. They don't have any interest in reconciling Jewish and Palestinian rights. The state of Israel is seen as illegitimate. It must be dissolved, not necessarily through force, as Hamas, Hezbollah, Islam Jihad, ISIS, and the alphabet soup of radical Islamic groups want to do through force of arms, but also through the force of demography. And we can see that reflected in the call for the right of return and in the call for the one state solution, which amounts to a return of the descendants of Palestinian refugees to their homes in Israel which would turn Israel into an Arab majority state and terminate Jewish sovereignty. Now, BDS proponents are fully aware that when they call for the right of return and the one state solution, as is prominently always noted in every platform of BDS, they're actually calling for national suicide, and they use that term. They don't hide the true intention here. They openly say it not Palestine alongside Israel, but Palestine instead of Israel. Okay, so that I think is the first place we need to start with interrogating this. But we can move on to other points. Political Zionism at its core is the belief that self-determination for the Jewish people is an answer to millennia of persecution. But here's the curious thing. Okay, what we find is that anti-Zionists simply don't see Jews as insecure, either in Israel or anywhere else, anywhere else in the world. They make these big promises that Jews will be safe as minorities in a new state of Palestine, or that they can live very safely as minorities in other countries, even though Israel exists precisely because Jews could never be assured of that security and survival. They could never trust in those promises. So in, in a sense, the anti-Zionist the anti position is very callous. It's a, it's a cruel and callous insensitivity to legitimate Jewish fears of survival, to legitimate Jewish fears for their own basic security. And I would argue that the willingness to consign Jews once again to a vulnerable and precarious position, to a vulnerable and precarious future, the willingness to throw Jews under the bus in the pursuit of Palestinian national rights, that that is also an anti-Semitic stance. So when you see progressives for Palestine who chant, long live the Intifada, as they did last week outside the security perimeter at the DNC in Philly, and where American flags and Israeli flags were both burned, when you see that, and when you see people's chanting, as they do every year during Israel Apartheid Week on American and European campuses, and they chant, Palestine must be free from the river to the sea, or when you see Hezbollah flags raised aloft as they were a couple weeks ago in the streets of London, these people either think Jews will be safe as Jews in a state of Palestine, or they just don't give a damn. They just don't care 
that much about whether Jews will be safe or not. And the truth is, is that Jews never did fare very well in Muslim-majority countries. They were sometimes left alone, left alone, tolerated as second-class citizens, but their position was always insecure. Yes, there were pogroms, like the Farhud. Yes, there were degrading economic and social repressions, and today, one of the last remaining Jews in Egypt has passed away. There are now only a handful of Jews left in Egypt. It used to be a thriving community. What we're seeing is a proliferation of classic anti-Semitic tropes. In California, at Stanford, Stanford University, premier institution, a student on the school senate recently argued that it was not anti-Semitic to claim that Jews control the media, the banks, the government, and all other social institutions. So at this prestigious university, a junior in the student governing body thought it was totally fine to talk about Jewish malevolent omnipotence, about Jews controlling the world. It's not an isolated case of idiocy. It's a moral failing in some circles of the enlightened left, which now views debating whether Jews control the media or the banks as a permissible form of discourse about power and privilege. It's now okay for students and professors at our finest colleges and the rest of polite society to entertain vile stereotypes, vile stereotypes that you once could only see displayed on the very fringes of the far right. Now, most of the rest of my talk will be focused on anti-Semitism from the left. And that's not to minimize the Jew hatred of the right. We've seen some pretty ugly stuff this election cycle. Uh, we've seen Jewish journalists who have been critical of Donald Trump. They've been subjected to a barrage of anti-Semitic harassment. Uh, some of you who are online, uh, how many of you tweet? Facebook. So, so, okay, great. Um, so I very recently, uh, because Bill forced me to, uh, became a uh, uh, subscriber to Twitter, and so now I've been exposed to this. Um, but you can just go online and have, have, a, have a look and get a sense. Um, online it's coordinated by the use of these punctuation-based codes. They're called echoes and they're used to identify and brand Jews on the internet. And it works with Google Chrome, I don't know exactly how it works, but it places thousands of these, thousands of Jews, with Jewish sounding last names on social media, have these parentheses placed around their names. And once you're marked or branded, you get flooded with malicious tweets and messages. And a great deal of this kind of internet filth is generated from the far right or what is called the alt-right uh, today in the discourse. Um, and I can give you just one example, there are so many, um, but this is really recent. You may recall Melania Trump sparked a, <coughs> an uproar at the RNC having uh, plagiarized a portion of her speech from an earlier speech of Michelle Obama, right? And there were, there were a lot of people, they blamed Mrs. Trump, then they blamed her speech writers, huh? but there were people who blamed the Jews. And so, former KKK Grand Wizard David Duke, avid Trump supporter, said there's a devious Jewish conspiracy at play. And that was what he sent over on social media. This is a con job. This is sabotage. This is political character assassination. A plan from the get-go. Who? By who? By people who like to eat gefilte fish. Okay. And you can read about it, about what he wrote um, online. So basically, we have these racists on the right who, like they always have, they view Jews as foreign contaminants, they're contaminating the white gene pool. But in some respects, I think it deserves a separate talk, um, the anti-Semitism on the right. Why is that? Because what we find, I think it's very interesting, um, is that in the populist movements and the parties of the right, and the conservative right today, if you think about conservative right parties of France or in Germany and elsewhere too, there's in fact been a very deliberate effort to detach, to downplay, and even to repudiate the anti-Semitism and anti-Zionist positions that were once the hallmark 
of the right in those places. So you have, for example, in Holland, if you think about the Freedom Party, led by Geert Wilders, it's very openly pro-Israel. Uh, and one of the leading voices against anti-Semitism in that country. And so, so I think it deserves a separate, a separate conversation. Uh, my point today is that that's not the way the left has been rolling. Um, what we find in leftist circles is a rising and a growing anti-Zionism. Uh, in a way, it's become a new legitimate method or means of hating Jews. Uh, Yves Garrard calls it rich Jew anti-Semitism. Here, Jews are cast as anti-victims in a prevalent culture of victimhood. <clears throat> so on the left, the demon Jew has morphed into the demonological Jewish state, uniquely malevolent, full of bloodlust, controlling, acting in bad faith, tricky, devious, the obstacle to a better world. Israel has become the Jew among nations. So let's think a little bit about what it means when you have this kind of discourse. Who gets neglected? Who gets uplifted? Okay? And that's what I want to talk a little bit about now. So one thing that we can think about is what it means for Christians and what it means for Palestinians. So recently there was an attack on a French church, right? And a brutal murder of its priests. What does that mean? What it means and what it signals is the arrival in Europe of the type of persecution and intimidation that's long been familiar to Christians in the Middle East. In Syria and Iraq, the Islamic State is perpetrating a genocide. But even when Christians are not being slaughtered or kicked out of their homes or forced to pay a tax, these Christian communities in the Middle East are dying out. Christians cannot openly practice their religion in most parts of the Middle East. The Christian communities there may never be restored. Only in Israel are Christians thriving. The anti-Israel movement ignores the voice of this community. And I've written extensively about this, about how small groups of anti-Israel activists have been packing Protestant denomination conferences and synods and annual meetings with Palestinian Christians who adhere to an anti-Semitic supersessionist ideology. And it's the voices of these people, Christian Israeli Father Gabriel Nadaf and others in Israel, who are silenced, who are left out of the conversation at today's, in today's mainline Protestant churches in America. Many of them are passionately loyal to Israel, to their country, and they are silenced. There are many Christians living in Israel who want to integrate more with the state and society. They're enlisting in record numbers in the IDF, but they have to do it in secret because they're constantly being attacked and threatened and harassed by Muslims. And now Israel is even giving some of them police protection. Why isn't their plight being addressed in America's church pews? Okay, so the reality is that the obsessive focus on Israel's alleged crimes does a grave disservice to the hundreds of thousands of Middle East Christians who are desperate for our help. There seem to be no church resolutions or protest marches for them. But I think that Palestinians too are hurt by anti-Zionism, by the anti-Zionist movement, and by BDS. We know that BDS is detrimental to the livelihoods of West Bank Palestinians, which is why so many of them don't support boycotts or divestment. There was a report just released this week by Palestine Media Watch, which is a watchdog group, and the researchers documented why Palestinians prefer to work for Israeli employers. Well, they pay twice as much. They benefit from equitable labor laws in Israel, and there's far less graft and exploitation of wages. Nearly 23 Palestinians work in settlements, nearly another 100,000 in Israel, and polls show a high percentage of Palestinians want more work opportunities in the West Bank, not less. BDS does not give a toss about them because their goal is to destroy Israel down to the last Palestinian. And what we saw this past week is the backfire, right? SodaStream is hiring, new, uh, hiring in their new facility in the Negev. They've hired hundreds of new 
employees in southern Israel. Many of them are Bedouin. Uh, back in 2014, the company was forced to close its factory doors in Malay Dumim, outside of Jerusalem, because of a relentless campaign by BDS, relentless pressure on this company. 500 Palestinians lost their jobs, and here they're crying. Okay, they're crying because they lost their jobs. They had to stop working. Some had worked for the company for over a decade. The company is trying to rehire them. That's in the media reports. A company executive said we're trying to now rehire hire them. But they're now in Israel, so there's permits, there's issues, okay? It was different when they were out in the West Bank. So West Bank Palestinians lost out. Israeli Arabs will now reap the benefits. I've also written about how BDS harms Palestinian peacemakers. There are brave, courageous, civil and human rights activists. You have one here, Bassam Eid. Um, and Bassam Eid and others like him, they're courageous, they're brave, they're human rights activists in the true sense of the word of being anti-racist human rights activists. They tirelessly advocate for coexistence and peace. But central to BDS isn't just boycotts, it's not just divestments, it's also keeping Israelis from talking with Arabs, keeping Israelis from engaging with anybody else and keeping Arabs away from Jews. And I've written about how Palestinian peace activists have been harassed and how coexistence groups like the Hug campaign in Jerusalem was forced to shut down. They wanted to boycott hugging. Okay, that, 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 that's how absurd this is. Okay, the anti-Israel movement wants you to forget that Mahmoud Abbas was elected in 2005 for a four-year term. It's now 2016. There is endemic corruption and repression in the Palestinian Authority, which controls the West Bank. 98% of Palestinians are under occupation in the West Bank. It's an occupation of the repressive Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority has rejected numerous peace offers over the years. It routinely incites to violence with the relentless campaign of anti-Jewish hatred. Generations of kids are being raised on this diet of hate. It denies Israel any place. It denies Jews any state within any borders. And, and that's the PA. It's not even talking about Hamas. Okay. Hamas are merchants of war. That's all. You cannot call them anything else. Rejects Israel's right to exist. They busily build terror tunnels. They're funding summer camps that are a parent's worst nightmare. But BDS sees Israel solely to blame for the failure of peace and is exclusively deserving of punishment. This movement to criminalize Israel is a crime in and of itself. So what we have is Israel being framed, and I think it is being framed, as the last and ugliest remnant of Western imperialism. It's become the designated scapegoat in a great morality play. Sometimes I feel like I'm living in a Shakespeare play. Right? It's a great morality play of good versus evil, right? A redemptive drama of global emancipation. And the accusations raised against Israel are simply not directed at any other state, including those that have committed and are committing today far more, far worse human rights violations than Israel has managed to do. In the last several weeks, some have questioned why Turkish academia isn't also coming in for boycotts. Erdogan and his Islamist AKP party are going after the academics in a big way. There's been a complete suspension of academic freedom. Thousands of faculty have been forced to resign. Administrators have been sacked by the hundreds. Academics aren't being allowed to travel outside the country. In Israel, university professors are among the most critical of their government. Believe me, I know, I know a lot of them, and they are very much on the left and very, very critical. Okay, but, it, but, but Turkish universities are different because the government has populated so many of them with functionaries and their own lackeys over so many years. So Turkey is in fact carrying out policies in higher education, and has been for some time, that the BDS supporters falsely accuse Israel of adopting. And I'm not a fan of boycotts, certainly not of academic boycotts, even in the case of Turkey, 
where most of the scholars will soon be flunkies of Erdogan, to be frank. Uh, but it's still worth being able to interact with them, um, just as we did with academics in the Soviet Union, just as we did with academics in authoritarian countries. Okay, we tried to interact with such academics. Um, it's telling, though, that BDS won't turn its attention to Turkey. I think it reflects a moral hypocrisy of this movement. There are a number of cognitive biases and errors. Uh, and as someone who's kind of dabbles in political psychology, I find this fascinating. So among the many cognitive biases of contemporary anti-Zionist discourse is one involving attribution error. If Israel does something bad, it's because Israel is evil. It's an evil state. Uh, but if Israel does something good, like protect gay rights, uh, that's just propaganda that's designed to cover up its vile actions. So anything positive about Israel is framed as just a ruse. You may have heard of the term pinkwashing. Any of you heard of that term? Okay, some of you. So let me introduce you to this latest bizarre attribution error. Um, pinkwashing is the notion that Israel is making this mendacious attempt to persuade people that it's tolerant and a respecter of human rights, but what it really is is an imperialist baby killer, but it's trying to cover that up through a positive human rights record. So all the relative freedom and rights that Israel affords to its gay citizenry, for example, and here's a slide, there are many others online that you can see of the latest Tel Aviv Pride Parade this spring. All, all that good, positive stuff that we see is just a ploy. It's deceitful, it's trying to deflect attention from horrendous abuse. And I wrote about a camp, this campaign to convince gays not to attend the annual Tel Aviv Gay Pride Parade. It means the largest in all of Asia. Um, uh, this Saturday, the New York Times covered the story of Israel's first transgender beauty queen. She's Arab, she's Christian, and she's Israeli, and she's proud of her identity. And the foreign ministry in Israel is springing $20,000 to get her to Barcelona, where she will uh, participate in um, the world trans pageant. Yeah, but, but this is all a ruse. This isn't really real. This is just a deceptive ploy. Um, Israel is the only Middle East country that has joined UNESCO's recent call to fight against homophobia and bullying in schools. The only Middle East country to join a UNESCO proposal. And how ironic is that, given that UNESCO is the most anti-Israel agency in the UN and is trying the hardest these days to deny Jewish attachment and connection to the Temple Mount. And this brings me to the issue of intersectionality and accounting for the success of BDS. And we have to figure that out. How has it had such success as a reactionary movement? And I think that the key is that it's been able to insinuate itself into a cluster of approved progressive causes from environmentalism to feminism to gay rights to Black Lives Matter. In academia, we call it intersectionality. It's a perspective that sees various forms of oppression, like racism, sexism, classism, ableism, homophobia. All these oppressions are intersecting, connected. So intersectionality is a theory. It's an intellectual perspective, an intellectual theory about how social forces are patterned and how they're connected. But it's also, it's also, become, it's gone beyond being a theory and a perspective, to being a community relations strategy. It's all about networking and building alliances. So basically, if, you're, if you see your group as oppressed, then you must also see Israel as part of the dominant white male heterosexual power structure that is doing the oppression, and you must join forces with the BDS movement. Okay, so I have this slide because it's my alma mater, Columbia University, where Students for Justice for Palestine succeeded in convincing No Red Tape, which is a group that was founded to fight sexual violence and campus rape, they succeeded in convincing these, these, this group, No Red Tape, to join up with them. Okay, here you have a, an example of that. 
Today, BDS is also firmly entrenched in the Black Lives Matter movement. Delegations have gone to Israel, but they actually only go to the West Bank, and they never speak to any Israelis. Okay, so that, that's not an Israel trip, so that's why Marshall's is so much better. Um, and so they come back depicting the... Also going to the West Bank. <laughs> yes. You gotta speak to both people, right? It's 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 a conflict not of one. It's 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 an it's an age-old conflict. It's got multiple actors involved. You need to speak to everybody, but they don't do that, and they come back depicting the conflict as a struggle, and this is exactly how they depict it: a struggle between white supremacist colonialists, who are the Israeli Jews, and an oppressed, dark-skinned racial group which are the Palestinians. Okay, now, now how, why is that, why is that just people are laughing? Because anybody who's gone to Israel knows there are Sephardic and there are Mizrahi and there are Ethiopian Jews who make up nearly half of Israel's Jewish citizenry and they're descendants of refugees who found safe harbor in Israel, what we call the Jewish Nakba that happened between 1948 and 1952. And so this completely erases them. I mean, it erases the Sephardim and the Mizrahi and the Ethiopian Jews, uh, this narrative. Now, Black Lives Matter, I think, is an important movement. I think it's drawn attention to a much needed conversation that we have to have in this country about policing in our towns and our cities, about police interaction with minorities. But this movement has been hijacked. There is no other way to describe what is going on here. It has been hijacked by radical voices, and because of that, it is surrendering its credibility. There's absolutely no connection, no connection, between the challenge of racism in America, the problems of policing in America's cities, and the situation facing Palestinians in Gaza or the West Bank. The issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has nothing to do with institutionalized racism. Okay? And conflating it with black concerns in America is ludicrous. So basically, in accommodating the BDS narrative, Black Lives Matter is failing to live up to its basic foundational principles as an anti-racist and anti-oppression movement. These are the principles that Martin Luther King espoused, and he was a Zionist. And the betrayal of his message is what is happening here. And for me, what was most striking uh, was, one, was when Richard Lakin uh, was murdered over the recent uh, intifada, the stabbing intifada. The most recent victim of the Palestinian resistance, in quotes, resistance, was this American Israeli, Richard Lakin. He was an advocate of Israeli-Arab coexistence while he lived in Israel. He was a longtime defender of civil rights. He marched with Martin Luther King. He marched for black rights. Not very remarkable for Jewish Americans because you know, Jews have all, always worked for the civil rights cause in large numbers. So a civil rights activist is murdered and basically Black Lives Matter is dancing on his grave. Okay, so we have today a situation where Black Lives Matter and BDS are championing as role models terrorists like Rasmia Odeh. Rasmia Odeh orchestrated the death of two Hebrew University College students 40 years ago. She was convicted in a free and fair trial, according to international arbitrators. She was convicted in 1969. She served time in an Israeli prison, but then she was released in a prisoner exchange. She eventually came to the U.S., she became a citizen, but she lied on her immigration forms about her past history. She's never shown any remorse for the crime. Now, Rasmia Odeh is entitled to due process. She is entitled to challenge her 2014 conviction for immigration fraud. But that does not mean that Black Lives Matter should champion her as a hero, which is what they are now doing. And you have got college kids on campuses across the country who are holding rallies for this unrepented terrorist who killed two innocent Israeli college kids. It's just monstrous. It's, it's grotesque. It's absolutely grotesque. So we have to ask, how the hell did we get here? 
Okay, how did we get here? And that's my last 15 minutes, and then, and then we'll break up. How the hell did this happen? How did the global progressive left come to adopt such a demonizing anti-Zionism? The left, which should be hostile to racism in all its forms, and it's now weaving so many patterns of hate around Israel. Why would Judith Butler, who's in the top picture on the top here, she's a leading lesbian feminist uh, in California, uh, college professor. She's the doyen of the BDS movement. And yet she declares Hamas and Hezbollah as progressive movements of the left. Those are her words. These are progressive movements of the left. In European leftist circles, including in British academia, there are high levels of solidarity with Hamas and explicit defense of its terrorist tactics. We all know about Jeremy Corbyn here, the leader of Britain's opposition party, Labour Party, who has called Hamas and Hezbollah his friends and agents of, quote, long-term peace and social justice and political justice in the whole region. <laughs> He invited to Parliament Raid Salah, who's an Islamist who believes Jews were behind 9-11. He called him an honored citizen. The left seems to be, and it's not a you know, complete uh, blank picture, but it seems to be unmoved by Islamist terror in general and Palestinian terror in particular. Silent about the Gaza tunnels. Even some liberals are acknowledging that to their credit. One recently said in Forward, uh, all we hear from the moderate and far left about the latest tunnel discovery is crickets. Nothing, right? A deafening silence, and it's a moral and political mistake. And I think it's not just a political mistake, it's perverse, it's demented. That's what it is. So to understand this, to understand this, we need to go back. We need to go back to the post-World War II period. We need to look at how anti-Semitism picked up steam in certain European leftist circles on account of Soviet anti-Semitic propaganda. We see it in the UN Zionism is Racism Resolution. We see it in the Association of Radical Islamist Terrorists with the far left in Germany and other parts of Europe. This has been documented extensively in a new book by University of Maryland historian Jeff Herf. And I'm waiting my way through it now. It's really worth looking at because this is the roots. These are the origins of what we have today. And it's also important to note that BDS did not originate in the West Bank as a call from civil society organizations there. The roots of BDS are in the 2001 World Conference on Racism in Durban. That was a coming out party for today's trope of Israel as an apartheid state. At that conference, there was blatant hatred of the Jew. The Protocols of Elders of Zion was circulated. People were chanting, Hitler didn't finish the job. Uh, people were telling Jewish delegates to take off their yarmulkes. Uh, Israel was called a hate crime. There were shouts of Jew, 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 Jew in the assembly hall. It got so bad that the U.S. delegation walked out. Okay, and that was in 2001. Now, the BDS manifesto that was presented in Durban in 2001 was prepared at a prior meeting. In what country do you think it was prepared in? Anybody know? You know, I know. <laughs> Bill, you can't say. But does anybody else know? Does anybody know where the BDS manifesto for boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel was prepared before Durban? Nope. Iran. A meeting in Tehran. Yes, it's all documented. It's not, I'm not making it up. It's documented in multiple sources. People don't know about that. Because they think it originated in 2005 as a call from the West Bank Palestinian civil society activists. No, it originated earlier and they adopted it. Now, there's another source of anti-Zionism of the left. It's the anti-Israel narrative offers some freedom from Holocaust guilt. Now, this is a little bit outside of my bailiwick. Um, but I thought I would share it. Um, the Durban, and that, that's politics, so that I can get my mind around, but the anti-Israel narrative is offering freedom from Holocaust guilt. That's the psychologist, but I'll just share it. Um, the images of Israelis acting brutally, even though Israel actually scores the lowest in terms of civil, civilian casualty ratios in modern urban warfare. So if you look at modern urban warfare, 
and you look at all countries, and then you look at all democracies, and you kind of start scoring how badly do they do in terms of civilian casualty ratios, Israel scores very well. Okay, and there's multiple, multiple studies of that. But instead we get these images of Israel acting brutally, and experts say that these images may help to symbolically replace or erase the images of little Jewish children in the Warsaw Ghetto. Kind of like this, right, split personality, the little kid in the Warsaw Ghetto becomes the little kid in Gaza. Okay, and so Eve Gerard, again, I mentioned her, she's written the most on this, she notes that Anti-Semitism tends to feel good. It's fun to participate in anti-Semitism because it enables people to present themselves as morally pure to others, uh, as warriors for social justice, as champions of the weak against the great evils of apartheid and colonialism. It allows you to present yourself visibly as involved in a struggle for justice and for the innocent victims of tyranny. And I think, and I see this a little bit on campus too, speaking truth to power, you're flouting conventions, you're acting so uncivilly, you're railing against convention, it's edgy, it's a little subversive, it's a bit outrageous. A lot of people live for that, you know, and a lot of people on campus kind of live for that. So maybe there's some, some of that going on too. So what can we do about this? And I think, one of the first things we can do is, if you see something, you should say something. We should name and shame, we should stigmatize anti-Semitism as hate speech, just like any other form of racism, um, even when it comes out of the mass of minority groups. So recently, Cynthia McKinney, the former Democrat from Georgia, uh, now with the Green Party, she garnered headlines for claiming on social media that an Israeli photographer who had been on hand at Nice and in Munich, at those terrorist um, atrocities, uh, proves that Israel was behind both of those attacks because this photographer happened to be in both places. And then she linked it to this uh, conspiracy, widely discredited, called the Dancing Israelis Conspiracy, uh, the conspiracy that five Israelis were arrested in New Jersey on 9-11 after being seen celebrating the attack. Uh, it's just a bogus hoax, it's just a conspiracy. Um, so these comments were identified, disseminated, roundly condemned, and we have to do more of that. We need to call out the anti-Semitic effects of anti-Zionism. What made McKinney's statements so vile is that they played into classic anti-Semitic conspiracy myths that Jews hold the keys to what ails the world. So if we could just somehow eliminate or rid the world of Jews, we'd all be better off. And those kinds of conspiratorial, conspiratorial claims, they all suggest an outside influence of the Jew. We have to connect the dots. It's the myth of Jewish centrality, and there's a long tradition that, that has construed the Jew as this dangerous purveyor and transmitter of evil. Tropes about omnipotent power abound. Um, versions of that trope uh, were Jews um, having tentacles or being a spider around the world. Today we see this kind of propaganda a lot, that the Jewish state has become the killer octopus, the sinister, bloodthirsty Israelis responsible for all these human rights violations. And so the remedy in the past was you defeat the Jew, you save the world. Today you defeat the Jewish state, you also save the world. Okay, so there you go. Okay, now it's easy to spot the kind of crack pottery out of Cynthia McKinney, right? But, you know, when we see something like that, you know what I that's the same thing. Right, but there's a really thought-provoking article by David Hazoni, he's the editor of the Tower website, and I really strongly recommend that you have a look at it, because he suggests that there's an anti-Semitism we don't talk about. The anti-Semitism that goes something like this. If Israel were just to back down, if Israel were just to back off, make more concessions, withdraw, okay, it may not solve all the problems of the world, but it'll solve a lot of problems, and it'll solve the problems of the Middle East, and we'd be so much better off. So Israel rises to the very top of the global foreign policy agenda as a problem to resolve. And that's a larger narrative, and Hazoni says that it's part of a broader anti-Semitic argumentative web. So I would say to that, the answer to that is, 
Yemen is not a mess because of Israel. Syria is not disintegrating into chaos because of Israel. Not Libya, not the Iranian revolution, rise of Al-Qaeda, ISIS. Nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But we have a myriad of American foreign policy makers who have espoused the view, it's a bipartisan view actually, that Israel is the central problem undermining Middle East peace. Now, they're not Jew haters. They're not dedicated to hurting Jews, but that is an anti-Semitism in its effect all the same, and we have to call it out by its name. We need to discredit claims that violence against Jews is different. Over the last number of years, how many times have we heard when there are attacks on Jews, the Jews brought it on themselves. Israel's actions cause the hatred. Jews bring hostility on themselves by their own behavior. Right? So the hatred, the anti-Semitic hate speech, and even the anti-Semitic hate crimes is excusable, understandable, maybe even appropriate as a form of protest because Israel is so bloodthirsty. So that's the inevitable byproduct. Um, and, and, and we, in, in addressing it, we are the sensitive ones to human rights and injustice. There are a lot of respectable people who believe these things now. It's nothing new. Uh, Jews have always been blamed for whatever bad things happened to them. And today it's just a new variant of that anti-Semitism. It's just repackaged that when we see verbal and physical assaults on Jews, it's politically justified on account of Israel's malevolence. And here's just one tweet by the famous and controversial academic Stephen Salada, which I think perfectly showcases this kind of bigotry. We need to stand in solidarity with those who are targeted by the anti-Zionist movement. Last year, you had Matisyao come, come to Ithaca. Many of you probably went to hear him. Uh, there was a campaign to get this American Jewish artist disinvited from a Spanish musical festival. Uh, he could come, but only if he agreed to sign a paper disavowing Israel. This guy's not even Israeli, okay? He was the only artist asked to make a political statement. But there was an uproar, right? And the festival eventually reversed its decision. He played, he wrote about the intense, seething, anti-Semitic hatred he was subjected to while performing. But he did perform, and that was because people raised their voice. And he also mentioned in his many blogs after his performance uh, there that he was very grateful for the outpouring of support that he received. Last year, I wrote about the shunning of Rabbi Susan Talve. She's a St. Louis progressive. She's a prominent activist. She's a national voice on civil rights. She lit the Hanukkah menorah at the White House uh, this past December, you may recall. This lady was vilified as a terrorist. Why? Because she's critical of Hamas targeting Israel with missiles and terror tunnels. Okay, and, and because she went on one APAC-sponsored trip at some point. Okay, so here you have a major civil rights activist. She's on the left. She's written critically of the occupation. She's critical of settlements. But that is not good enough for the local Jewish Voice for Peace chapter in St. Louis. And it's not good enough for the Black Lives Matter chapter in St. Louis, which has been infiltrated by the anti-Zionists. Okay. Um, but... You know, for these people, the, the virulent opposition to Israel is what it means to be a good, righteous Jew. And it turns out that not a lot of St. Louis Jews and a lot of non-Jews in St. Louis didn't much like having their beloved Rabbi Susan Talve vilified as a terrorist. So they stood by her, and the smear campaign against her kind of petered out because of that uproar. And now we have the great new story of uh, Gal Gadot, an Israeli. She's the leading lady in the new Wonder Woman movie. Uh, she's being vilified on social media. Why? Because she's Zionist. And why is she a Zionist? Because she served mandatory two-year service in the IDF. Everybody's drafted. That makes her a war criminal. Uh, and uh, they're trying to boycott this movie. And one said on Twitter, I really wanted to like Gal Gadot so bad she seems so cool and nice, but then I found out she was a Zionist. Yeah, so that ended it. I'm not going to go see the movie. Well, we should all go see that movie, and we should make it a blockbuster when it comes out next summer. Um, critics like to say, I mean, if there's a 
critics in the room would say at this point, say, wait, but you know, you're equating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism because you want to silence criticism of Israel. You want to silence legitimate criticism. And they'll tell me, yeah, being a McCarthyite, okay, you're really trying to silence. But, but actually, the ones that are being silenced are the Israeli fact. One in six Israeli academics now report having to hide their nationality in order to get published. One in six Israelis in the academy in Israel say they have to hide their nationality to get published. A colleague of mine uh, recently tweeted this weekend that a friend of hers is afraid to mention in class that he has dual citizenship and thus was you know, served in the army, was drafted into the army, asked whether he should disclose the information in, in, in a class. It's unbelievable. I mean, no one wants to jeopardize their job, no one wants to get the stink eye from colleagues at meetings or be bypassed for promotions because they're hassles. So Zionist Jewish faculty and Israeli faculty keep their heads down and they steer clear of con controversy. And if they're engaged in controversy, it can get really ugly. So some of you may know the story of Andy Pesson at the University of Connecticut. He posted a short comment on Facebook. You know, I, I, I don't think it was an, ex you know, seemed a little juvenile of a comment, uh, the way he phrased it. It's fine to criticize the comment. He actually apologized for it and continued to explain his position. But underneath this, this, this Facebook comment, he said, look, you know, I'm critical of what Hamas is doing. I don't think Hamas should be should be targeting innocent civilians. I, I call that terrorism. So would most other people, and so does international law, right? But for that, he was subject to a vendetta, to what I would call a witch hunt. He was accused of hate speech. He was denounced by faculty members. He was left out to hang and dry by college administrators. They took no disciplinary action against the students who had defamed him. He got death threats. He was so traumatized, he had to take a medical leave of absence, and this case is not unique. So I had a chance to meet Andy in person in May at a conference, and we went to dinner, and you know, he told me how much it meant to him to have the support of fellow colleagues from all across the U.S. and across the world. So in our professional and personal lives, when we see a Zionist colleague or an Israeli friend being ostracized or harangued or bullied, we need to speak up about it. So just have a few more slides. Um, I don't think we should minimize the problem. Uh, recently, uh, Netanyahu, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, said we have beaten the boycott campaign. He came to a Knesset hearing and he presented a color-coded map showing how many nations are trying to forge diplomatic relations with Israel today. And he said we're acting against BDS so they're on the defensive. Um, BDS has failed miserably in terms of applying economic pressure on Israel. That is for sure. All these relentless campaigns to get stores, companies, governments, churches, trade, labor unions, student organizations to boycott, to divest. The reality is Israel is so integrated into the global economy. Its high tech sector and other industries are so valuable. It's too important uh, for others to, to isolate it. And there's now anti-BDS legislation that's passed in many states, and companies are beginning to act accordingly. But BDS isn't just impacting the Israeli economy, right? Um, and, and, and it is a threat. Uh, it's doing great damage to the mental and moral health of Americans. Today, 70% of Americans support Israel. But will that be true in 25 years' time? What will be the level of support when the current generation of students, having passed through the anti-Israel grinder on college and internalizing all its falsehoods, will be entering the profession and producing the national attitudes and voting positions of the near future? They'll have sat through classes like those taught by Joy Cartega at Oberlin College, who posted this kind of anti-Semitic garbage on her Facebook page. And what about the impact on American Jewish kids? There's a generation of young Jewish people who are suppressing their Jewish identity in order to get by. And that's at a time when every group, every group of allegedly aggrieved undergraduate is getting a safe space to protect their ethnic, racial, and sexual sensitivities. But there's no safe space for Zionist Jews. There is just no safe space for them. Uh, even at Hillel, 
the one, sometimes on some campuses, the only place that offers a welcoming home is now under attack by those who want to turn it, too, into another campus arena that will be hostile to Zionism. BDS is a form of domestic anti-Semitism, as noted in this quote. And we can think of it in terms of this place that I'm standing at, which you know, is where I'll start to end, uh, at the supermarket. It's really, it's, it's really telling and fitting that I would be giving this talk, this talk at Green Star because BDS activists tried to get Sabra Humos removed from the shelves. Yeah. And I call it the supermarket invasions. Um, and so Jewish supermarket goers who just want to buy an Israeli avocado or some hummus are accosted by people chanting that they are war criminals. Uh, we've had that in Europe, in Australia, in South Africa. And you know, most of us are, are, you know, we want a quiet life, we're not activists. We know that BDS is discriminating based on national origin, but we don't want to cross an, an angry picket line to go do our shopping for dinner, right? So, um, so we don't go, we go somewhere else. We go to Wegmans, we go, we go somewhere else. BDS is essentially a campaign to make people angry at Israel, uh, to make people angry with Israelis, and with people around the world who are suspected of supporting Israel uh, and Israelis. So that is a real threat, and it's growing. We need to stand against all racisms, but we should not belittle the threat to Jews. Uh, there's a lot of stories running with these kinds of headlines. Uh, is there a future for Jews in Europe? In any country you look at, I saw a report this week on Scottish Jews feeling a lot more uncomfortable. Uh, we have uh, a number of posts on legal insurrection that's covered Malmo, Sweden, in a place where you cannot even walk while Jewish. You wear a kippah, you wear tzitzit, you are taking your life into, into risk, right? People have been heckled, roughed up for doing that. Uh, in Nice, you can go online and read a little bit about the Jewish community there, 20,000 Jews who are already not wearing kippahs because they're too afraid. Uh, throughout Europe, all synagogues have armed guards and have for some years. So do we feel those kinds of threats here? Do we feel those kinds of threats here? Um, and that I want to break you up to think about that. Now, the ADL reports anti-Semitism is on the rise um, from 2014 to 2015. Um, and you know we have data. We have data that anti-Muslim hate speech and hate crime is also on the rise. But it pales in comparison to the verbal abuses and assaults against Jews in our country. Here's the latest um, FBI uh, uh, statistics on as a percentage of religiously motivated hate crime. As a you know other hate crime against gay the gay community and against African Americans is higher. But when you just look at religiously motivated hate, we experience nearly 60% of it. Okay. Um, and what's the state that experiences in terms of the nation, that leads the nation in terms of the most anti-Jewish hate crimes, according to the FBI? New York. Hello. Welcome. Yes, New York. So, um, and I would add that some people, not everybody, but some people who rail against anti-Muslim racism are the ones who are also engaging in anti-Israel messaging. It's very sad. It's very sad when I see it, but, but, but it is happening. We're seeing more of it. Um, we saw it here in Ithaca. We saw it in Syracuse. The recent national campaign to put the public celebration of Hanukkah into service for an anti-Islamophobia agenda. Are we surprised that anti-Zionism was interjected into that event? It happened all over the country. We should condemn hate speech against all Americans. We should do it as Jews, as Americans, as decent human beings. I recently worked with my Jewish Federation on a statement in solidarity with the local and national Muslim community against Islamophobia. But we have to insist that this be reciprocated. The solidarity must be reciprocated. So interfaith efforts to combat racism are incredibly important, but not if they become a way of introducing anti-Israel through the back door. Not then, and we need to say this is not okay. We do not support this. We need to educate ourselves, and then we need to educate others. We need to challenge the lies 
We need to challenge the lies. Uh, last week, the Democratic member of the House Armed Services Committee compared Jewish Israeli settlers to termites that destroy homes. He was speaking at a DNC event in Philly, organized by the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Uh, and the termite reference got a lot of media attention, rightfully so, but he said other things too in his speech. He said the West Bank by law has roads where Palestinians can't travel, that Israel has legislated laws to prevent Palestinians for Jew-only travel. There are laws. That's what he said. He said Palestinians are barred from flying flags in the West Bank. He said Israel has the most right-wing government ever to exist in Israeli history. Now, much of it isn't true, what he said, or it needs to be qualified and put into context. The reality that we know from multiple Housing Start data is that Israeli Jews only live in 3% of the West Bank, and that outside of the major settlement blocks that hug the Green Line, and outside of East Jerusalem, there's been no settlement expansion in recent years. And a Jew building a second bedroom or a balcony in a legitimately purchased apartment in a Jewish neighborhood of East Jerusalem, a neighborhood that everybody knows, including the Palestinians and the Americans, that that neighborhood will revert back to Israel in a final peace deal, that person is not a war criminal. And that person is not an obstacle to peace. The ones today who are doing the illegal West Bank building are the Europeans who are subsidizing housing projects in Area C that are a complete contravention of the Oslo Accords. But those are empirical statements. It's not, it's not anti-Semitism. You can interrogate them with facts, with evidence, and you can have a debate. They aren't in and of themselves anti-Semitic. People are told over and over these days, and sometimes even by those on the left, that Israel is an evil country, that Israel is becoming a fascist state, that it applies apartheid to the Arab Israeli minority, that it denies Palestinian statehood, that it refuses to negotiate, that it suppresses freedom of expression. You name it. You name it. Um, and there are problems. Israel's not perfect, and it has, to, it has to make improvements, as all democracies do. But there is integration of Arabs and Jews in Israel that blacks in apartheid South Africa could only dream of. What I would argue is that over the years, uh, over the years, many, many well-meaning people have internalized a giant load of bullshit. That's, that's no other way. Giant load of bullshit from propagandists. We have to explain to people that to be pro-Israel does not require that you also be in solidarity with Hamas or with terrorists like Rasmi Odeh or with Marwan Barghouti, who's being honored by the French as an honorary citizen, this guy slit the throat of a Christian clergyman okay, and helped to orchestrate numerous terror events against Israelis. He's serving five life prison sentences for murder, including suicide bombings. This is messed up. Okay, it's messed up that you would give this guy an honor. It's a messed up world. <clears throat> so in conclusion, criticism of Israeli policy and politics is not anti-Semitic. Strictly speaking, Zionism doesn't require a belief in greater Israel. And the Israeli left is also Zionist, and it's fine to support the perspectives of the progressive Israeli left. But don't think that the Israeli left supports BDS, because it doesn't. BDS wants you to divest from companies like Hewlett Packard and Caterpillar and G4S that protect Israelis from terror. It wants the so-called apartheid wall, which is just a security fence. And it's not even a wall in most places. And it saves lives. And BDS wants it dismantled. This week, it's the Zionist Union, a party on the Zionist left, that's introducing a bill to get the wall completed because there have been too many terrorist infiltrations through weak links in the fence. That's not Netanyahu's Likud presenting that bill. That's the, an Israeli leftist party that says we want the wall completed, okay? We have, to, we have to know this information, understand it. Zionism is essentially not really about policies. It's about pride. It's about Jewish pride and the Jewish national will to live. And that's the Zionism that we have to own and defend, right? It enshrines the right of Jewish people to be just like every other people and to live freely in a sovereign nation. 
and it restored freedom and dignity to an oppressed people, and it continues to do that for Jews all over the world who still need her. That is profoundly liberal. It is a liberal position, and it is a progressive position, and it is a triumph of human rights, and leftists once knew that. They once knew that. But now, we have these old anti-Semitic tropes, including the blood libel and conspiracy that are emerging recycled out of the BDS movement. And we have to insist from the left that it do a better job in policing its intellectual borders. For too long, Jews who have refused to disavow their Zionism have been isolated, they've been vilified, they've been forced, forced out of the left, which they feel is their natural home, the liberal left. And most Jews who have been vilified have kept silent, but some are now fighting back. And they're saying, I shouldn't have to choose between supporting Israel and supporting progressive causes in the U.S. And more need to join that effort. And here's just some more blood libels that are circulating these days, including by Bassam Tamimi, who I understand came to third grade Ithaca public <laughs> school classroom. More on that. Um, to be a good leftist, a Jew should not have to denounce Israel. And I love this quote from Alan Johnson, who stated very eloquently last year in Fathom, we need to insist that the left build an intellectual firewall separating criticism of Israeli politics and policy from the demonology of Zionism in Israel, which is not legitimate and which can be legal. And so that's our task, and it's really a huge task. So thank you very much.